kind of ramp, so I think we can get started. Uh, it's really nice to see everyone here tonight. My name is Dana Hart. I'm the director of Ilsley Public Library. I'm very pleased to be introducing our speaker. Um, can everyone hear me okay? I don't have a mic. Okay. Uh, before we get started, I just want to make everyone aware of one thing. We do have restrooms in the back corner. There's a little bit of groundwater coming up in the space between the restrooms. It's the, it's the rain and the snow melt. And um, it's not bad, but I just didn't want anyone to be alarmed if the carpet kind of switches back. <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> now that at, that is out of the way, um, I'd like to thank the friends of Ilsley Library for supporting tonight's first Wednesday talk. I'd like to thank the statewide underwriters, the Alma Gibbs Donchian Foundation, the National Life Group Foundation, the Institute of Museum and Library Services through the Vermont Department of Libraries. And I'd like to thank our Middlebury series underwriter, the residents at Otter Creek. And I know we have a lot of Otter Creek um, attendees here tonight. John P. Keenan is a professor emeritus of religion at Middlebury College and an Episcopal priest who served St. Mark's Church in Newport from 2004 to 2009. He studied Christian theology at St. Charles Borromeo Seminary in Philadelphia and holds a PhD in Buddhist studies from the University of Madison or Wisconsin Madison. In his several published works on interreligious theology, he employs the insights of Mahayana Buddhist philosophy in a quest for new understandings of Christian faith and scripture. Please join me in welcoming John Keenan. Is this what? Yes, it is. What I propose to do is just to offer a few points for contemplation, for meditation, if you will. About how to read scriptures. And by that, I mean scriptures in their broadest sense. Religious text, indeed. But any kind of text. Civil texts. I mean, we have copies of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution that we keep like almost in religious shrines down in Washington at the Smithsonian. And they're very important. So I'm going to start with a, a few reflections on just how we interpret those, those texts and then move on to religious texts. Because I think whenever you've got any text that you regard as a classic or as a sacred text, that you have to both hold on to it and continually interpret it. You never really get done interpreting it. And the texts that we kind of cherish as Americans are first the Declaration of Independence. And if you read it, it sounds very much like a Christian creed. And in fact, I think they were modeled on Christian creeds. So we start, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's a creed. Many people, many countries wouldn't believe it. Many countries don't believe it, that individual rights business to countries that see people as collectives whether they're communist or whether they're just simply culturally more focused upon family and group, <clears throat> they don't accept it. The same thing happens in the UN Declaration of Human Rights because they also talk about individual rights. The General Assembly proclaims, they don't just announce or they don't, they actually proclaim, like they're in a pulpit, you know. They proclaim common standards that every individual may be taught and may be educated into. So they have a faith that individual people have to learn and they have to be taught, they have to be educated in order to appreciate just that each one of us, no matter where we are, we have individual rights. I think most European countries and most North American and South American countries sign that. Most other countries did not. 
because it doesn't really comport with their culture. It is a very Western creed, just like our uh, act of independence that depends upon John Locke and people like that, Enlightenment thinkers, because our founding fathers were such thinkers. But then we have a constitution, which doesn't sound so creed-like, because I think it's mainly intended to work out just what those visions might mean in everyday life. And in the Constitution, it tells us how we're going to have a government, how we're going to, what the branches are going to be, and what their mutual responsibilities are. And it also has, and I picked this one out because it's been a subject of much dispute, a Bill of Rights. And the Second Amendment to that Bill of Rights is justly famous. It proclaims, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Well, this is in the news a lot lately, but of course we don't have state militias. So that's always been a problem. When they wrote this, we did. And they were the only effective armed forces in the country because we were so afraid, our founding fathers, of tyranny, which meant England particularly, the British Empire, that we didn't want to set up anything that could parallel the English throne. So like in 1804, I read that the Standing Army of the United States, the Standing Federal Army, had 98 members. <laughs> which explains why when the British marched on Washington, nobody stopped them. There was nobody there to stop them. They would have had to call in a state militia. But as things developed and militias disappeared and the federal armed forces grew, even the National Guard can be now federalized at a moment's notice. Any president can do it whenever he wants, or she wants. Not yet, but soon. Uh, when it was written, though, there was always a dispute about whether that right belonged to the collective, that is, to the different states, or whether it belonged to individuals. Did it really mean that I can have any kind of gun I want? Did it mean that only the states could arm themselves if they gathered into militias? Well, that all changed in 2008 when the court, recognizing that we didn't have militias anymore, said that, no, it's an individual right. That they more or less rode out the militia part without saying so. But it also hedged its decision, and it was written by Judge Scalia, and it said that, this doesn't mean that people can have any kind of weaponry at all. It explicitly said that, you know, the government and states can limit the kind of weapons that are available. So you can't go out and buy, like, a rocket launcher. Just, you can't do it. You can buy a semi-automatic weapon, though, and that's where the argument is today. And when all those children keep on marching, they're saying that, the presence of such weapons is detrimental to their health. So I looked up stuff, and I found out that since the beginning of our country, and the, the beginning of when we have records for it, there have been 290 cases of school killings. And that's a lot. But most of them are one or two people. And most of them are motivated by the regular reasons people kill one another. They get angry, they go into rages, they want revenge, uh, and that's about it. They don't kill everybody else. The cases that kind of stood out, there was one in 1940 in Pasadena, California, where five people were killed. But that was a disgruntled teacher who had been fired, so he went back and killed four administrators and the teacher he blamed for his firing. It's understandable. <laughs> what you kind of get, you can kind of understand what's going on. He's really, really angry. And then the one that really broke into our, my consciousness anyway, happened in 1966 in, in Austin, 
at the University of Austin from the observation tower that some of you may remember. Some fellow with a high-powered rifle, a military rifle, I think, but not an automatic, you know, semi-automatic weapon, got in the tower and started picking off people, students who were walking around out there. And there were 17 dead then because they didn't know where the bullets were coming from. And even after they did, there, wasn't many pla there weren't many places to hide. In 89, in Stockton, there were six refugees from Southeast Asia killed and another 32 wounded by somebody who just didn't want refugees in the country. Mm -hmm. Don't know. In Iowa City, six professors were killed by a grad student who didn't pass his, uh, didn't get his PhD. His dissertation was turned down, so he came back. But again, that one's pretty clearly regular motives for killing people. You're just consumed with anger, hatred, and murder. And then it begins to change with Columbine. And there you have semi-automatic weapons. In Columbine, 15 dead, 21 wounded. We all remember that. Virginia Tech, 33 dead, 23 wounded. In Newton, Connecticut, 28 dead. Two wounded, it says. Most of them were killed. And then in Rosebud, Oregon, 10 dead, 9 wounded in 2015. And then Parkland, 17 dead and 4 wounded. So there's a pattern that we're faced with a new fact <coughs> that we have to somehow grapple with. That there is a series now of mass murders that before would have been just individual acts of hatred, anger, and killing. Now they're mass acts. And you have to make your own decision about, you know, that's what the argument is about. If these are facts on the ground, are they enough, are they factual enough to limit the sale of semi-automatic weapons? Or do we have a right to have them because we have them now? And what good would it do? So that Second Amendment to the Bill of Rights, part of it has been just pushed aside. The whole business about the militias, because we don't have them. And the other part of it says that we have the right to bear arms, but not any kind of arms. So that's a question that I leave you with. Because I think any text is going to be involved in the same kinds of conundrums. The same kinds of things that we hold dear, that we think are really important in our lives, but other parts that we don't quite like, uh, that we, we really don't know how to handle. So what I'm recommending for our consideration is that the first thing you do when you're confronted with any kind of a canon, any kind of a sacred text, any kind of a classic, is that you've got to step back. And you've got to understand that text from its own time and place. It's hard enough to understand the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights. But when you're dealing with Christian text or Jewish text, you're talking about texts that are 2,000, 2,500 years old, that developed in a culture far, far distant than ours, at a time that you can hardly imagine and when the relationships between people were totally different. In other words, there was then a different common sense at work than there is now. Common sense being the way we relate to one another, the way you know how to relate by just drawing on your common store of knowledge and having another insight about what to do next. Well, people, when the Bible was written, didn't know that. The, as we know it. They had a different common sense. They lived in a different society. People in China and India, they had a different common sense too because there were different expectancies ingrained in the society. So cultures really do differ. They really do say different things about very, very basic issues. So I think you have to step back all the time. But then I think you also have to step aside. 
not only do you have to dig back to find out what that text in its context means, but you can step aside and see what somebody else is saying about the same things. So for arguing gun rights, you can step aside and say, well, how did the Japanese do this? Why aren't there any mass killings in Japan? And pretty soon you find out because they don't have any guns. You can get a gun if you want to go hunt. It takes four years to go through the process. And they're going to check you out and they're going to allow you to have a hunting rifle and a certain amount of ammunition. And you can go hunting in the woods. And people do. But it's very well controlled. And so there are no mass killings. In Canada, it doesn't take four years, but it's still hard to get a gun. And so they don't have many mass killings either. And there are different countries like that, where you do not have an armed populace. And if you step aside and then look back, you wonder, is it worth it? You know. I mean, when you see all of those kids marching, it's their lives, it's not ours. Nobody comes in and kills old people, usually. <laughs> you know, we don't guard the doors here. We don't have to be afraid, but kids do. Because it's their lives that are on the line. But yet still, we have this long tradition of an armed populace from when we were afraid of Britain. And we still have, we have a tradition since 1980 in the Hyder Act that says each individual has the rights to self-defense. And you've got to figure it out. Well, you have to figure it out with a, with, a, with a Bible, too. Or with the Diamond Sutra, or with any text whatsoever. And I'm suggesting that for religious texts, stepping aside is looking at other traditions. Because all of these traditions treat the same issues. Why are we here? Why do we die? Why are we born? Does it mean anything? How do you live? How do you flourish? I mean, they're very simple and basic questions that children ask, and usually get told to shut up, you know, because we don't know the answers, or we're not quite sure of the answers, or we give them a religious truth. And that's supposed to keep everybody quiet, and sometimes it does. But they all answer the same kind of question. So when we step back with the text, you can be pretty sure it's dealing with the same kinds of issues. And the first thing that people try and do, and this is done widely by scholars of every tradition, is you try and understand the text in its place in its life. You try and understand the text in its context. So if you're dealing with a first century text, the context is first century society. It just makes sense. Uh, when the, Revo when the uh, Reformation happened, Martin Luther claimed we didn't have to pay any attention to tradition because that was kind of the ballywick of the Roman Catholic Church, and he wanted to get back to the Scriptures. So he said, we just have to read the Bible, and I think Calvin said the same, and see the plain meaning in the text, that it comes right out to us. That's not true. And it was demonstrated not to be true by the history of Lutherans and Presbyterians and everybody else, because they developed traditions of interpreting Luther and Calvin. Carl Barth is an interpreter of John Calvin. Everybody is reading on and reading deeper and reading differently, as it were. So you have to read a text find out where it was placed in its time and place. And then you have to figure out what kind of a text are you dealing with. I mean, there are some texts that are just poetry, not just, but I didn't mean to say that. There are poets here, better be quiet about that. You have to know what you're dealing with. Like, for instance, the book of Jonah. It's a short story. I mean, it's not history. Nobody ever got swallowed by a big fish. There never was a whale. The text doesn't say there's a whale. Text says it was a big fish. You could swallow it by a big fish. You don't hang out three days in its belly. <laughs> you know? The whole thing is, it's a parable. It's a funny, funny story. 
that God does whatever God wants, and he doesn't live up to the expectations of prophets. I mean, Jonah is sent to the most sinful city in the world, New York City. No, no, Nineveh. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> He's sent to this city. This has got nothing to do with the Jews. It's not part of their country. And God tells him to go there and convert everybody. And he says, right, right, I'm going to do this, and they're going to hear me. And like, uh, are you crazy? You're not behaving like God. You're not rational. And so, you know, they have the whole story of Jonah going down from the mountain. Usually when somebody's on a mountain, like the story begins, they're encountering God and having a theophany and having wonderful, deep experiences. Jonah is saying, oh, no, this can't be true. You're wrong, God. You're just wrong. So he runs, and finally when he gets spit out, he goes to Nineveh, he preaches in the streets, and everybody converts. It's like, a, you know, it's like a local clergyman going to New York, and everybody converted. It's not going to happen. But it did happen there, and the king ordered everybody to repent, and they all did. And all the men put on sackcloth and ashes, and all the women, and all the children, and all the cattle. That's what the text says. <laughs> all the cows have sackcloth and ashes on them, and they're repenting of their sins. So, now, if you're reading this text, something should affect you. Say, like, this is not history we're reading. This is a parable. This is a short story. So you have to know what kind of a text you're dealing with. If you read the Song of Songs, you may think it's just a pornographic love poem. And it is. Uh, but not just. But not just. Because the erotic desires of the lovers is supposed to stand in for the love of Israel, for God. But we're always pursuing God, and God's always kind of like playing around with us. Yeah. So that's one kind of interpretation. The Gospel of Mark invented the Gospel the genre, or the kind of text that Mark is. And it is a very, very strange book that we don't really usually appreciate because we overread it with Luke and Matthew. But in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus' disciples are dunderheads. They never get the point. They always misunderstand. They run away, and they don't come back. That's not the regular reading in Luke or Matthew. And at the end of the text, when the women go to the tomb, and there's a young man in white there, an angel or a messenger, says, Jesus is risen, he's not here. Tell the disciples, go to Galilee, they'll see him there. They don't do that. The women run away because they're scared, and the text ends. So the big question mark is, who's a disciple? And I think the artistry of Mark is to suggest that it's your question, the reader's question. It's my question. All of the, all of the apostles, the disciples of Jesus, have proven to be really <coughs> unwilling to convert, unwilling to be a disciple. The only people who seem to get Jesus are cameo characters who appear and then disappear from the text. So the end of Mark should leave you just thinking, what am I supposed to do? Is this really all off on me? But I suggest we don't read it that way, because we read it through the eyes of Luke, particularly in Matthew also, where there are lots of appearances. Because Mark couldn't be the end. If that really was the way it all happened, nothing would have happened afterwards, because nobody would have heard about it. But Mark didn't care about that. Mark cared about to make a point, to do a question mark about who are you? Are you a disciple? Assuming that he's writing this text to your fellow Christians. You know. So I think like you have to understand what kind of a text you're dealing with. And then, you know, there's a whole bunch of approaches to reading scriptures. You can try and do a historical approach and say the text means such and such in its time and place. You can analyze the rhetoric and see how it works, see when it switches from one mode of speaking, when it's doing, you know, exhortation or when it 
teaching doctrine or when it's telling people to go to hell. Or you find out what's happening in the text. Uh, <coughs> you could do a sociological reading of the text, trying to tell what it meant in its time and place and how it might apply here. So, for instance, you have in text uh, Colossians and Ephesians and 1 Peter 2, you have these things called household codes. Everybody's familiar with them. I think we still read in the church sometimes. And they say that women should be submissive to men. That's what the text says. That, it's the Bible. Well, I didn't write it. It's, just, it's in the Bible. Uh, we translate it usually because what it means is that wives should be submissive to their husbands. Because in the Greek Hellenistic household, that was the model. The man was the head of the household and had complete control over everybody in the household, especially his wife, also his daughters, his sons, his children, and the slaves. Because every household imagined there had a couple of slaves, at least. If it was large, like the text, like the household assumed in Ephesians and Colossians, it had a lot of slaves. Because the household had to have the economic engine that allowed it to exist. So there were probably slaves in various professions working. How are you going to take that over today? Well, the simple answer is we're not. We're not going to take it over. We're going to cross it out, which I think by and large people have, but not everybody. If you're a fundamentalist, you cannot do that. You cannot cross out a part of the text. You cannot ignore it. You just have to do the best you can to ameliorate it, to make it a bit better. And so you would stress then, as I think the authors, these are Paul's disciples who wrote both of these texts, I believe, that these authors tried to ameliorate it in their time. They, they said, yeah, that's true, the man's the head of the household, but he has to treat his wife with respect and love and cherish. And, and all that. And so, like, fundamentalist groups emphasize those things, although they have to keep the text intact. Another example, those two texts also borrow cosmology from ancient Greeks. They borrow the cosmology of the Stoics. They change it a bit, but they still have it. And one of the big, well, the big picture is that uh, all of the planets and all of the stars go around the Earth. You know, nobody thought the earth was flat. I don't know where that came from. I mean, ancients knew that the world was a globe. And all of the stars, and the, there are seven levels of heavens above the earth. Well, the top is one of which was God. But God was still within the cosmos. And the stars were all intelligent because they moved. And you don't get something to move without something else that pushed it. And so they said there were intelligences in the bodies in the heavens. Their big problem were the planets, or were those lights in the heavens that didn't have the same path. When, you know, these people didn't have lights, they didn't have electricity. So they knew the heavens, the stars, the night sky, more than we do. And when they went out to look, they really looked. They spent the whole night looking. And they saw these wandering lights in the skies, which is why they call them planets, because a planet means a wanderer. They didn't know yet what they were. They just thought there were other lights in the sky that wandered around, which caused them to think, like, what happens if all the stars begin to wander too? What keeps them all together? What if they just drifted apart? And that was a frightening thing. Some people said it can't happen because it's bounded. Other people said, no, there's empty space way beyond. And it could happen. All, all the stars just disappear from the night sky. It's still a possibility today if the universe is inflating still and everything is speeding away from everything else. But they all had something that kept it together. There had to be a force that kept the stars and they didn't know about galaxies or anything like that. But they kept the stars together. And the Stoics, being kind of naturalists, they thought the divine was the, 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 the intelligence imminent in the cosmos. And they said there is a cohesive force between the stars. 
Other people thought, no, it can't quite be that. They're just made of metal. That it has to be an active divine figure. And so they said, well, it's love. Love, you know, the Pythagoreans talked it that way, you know. And other people said it's Aphrodite, the goddess of love, or Eros, the goddess of love. That's what keeps the stars together. Well, Colossians, being a Christian text, says it's the risen Christ, that he holds the cosmos together. We can't affirm that. Because we know about a thing called gravity. What holds bodies together is gravity. Before we knew about gravity, it made sense to say that there was some divine force holding the world coherent, <coughs> holding it all together. But we can't accept an ancient Stoic cosmology, even if it's Christianized. It's just kind of silly. Nor can we accept that there are all these spirits in the stars or all these powers in the heaven. But people were very much concerned about that. They were concerned that there would be spirits that might threaten them. And you can read in New Testament text, you know, our battle is not with human flesh, but with the powers in the heavens who are inimical, inimical to our welfare and our good. So we have to pray to Christ so that he will protect us from them, and he will, because he has risen from the dead for that purpose. There's some very strange things in the Bible, in the New Testament, particularly because they get into these cosmological frameworks that we cannot live within. <coughs> I mean, even at the time of Newton, we couldn't live within them. And we certainly can't live within them now after Einstein. So there are parts of the text that we can't even approach and you can't really affirm. I mean, I would think it'd be almost impossible for people to affirm that Christ holds the cosmos together. So usually we just slide over that text. The way preaching usually goes is, in my humble opinion, is you read a bunch of text and you use them as a trampoline to talk about whatever the hell you want to talk about. <laughs> you just like pick a theme out of the text. And then you just go off and forget about the text. So, although we have scriptures and in all our churches we read them, I really don't be pay. We don't pay much attention to what we're reading, and we don't try and get into them. Although you could, they're not that hard. Uh, we just jump off them, and then usually witness to something that maybe some people recognize. Most of the people who are sitting listening say, "I wonder what that's about." You know, I don't know. So some people say that when we read, we have to read a text and demythologize it. Uh, Rudolf Boltman was the main guy who said that. That you have to realize you don't live in that three-story world of ancient days. We live in a modern world and we can't just keep on repeating the ancient myths. And everybody pretty much agrees with that in one version or another. Uh, and he said that the meaning of any scripture is going to be its meaning for a daily life, how it affects you, how it moves you, what it causes you to do, and the fact that it's a path structure, that every religion offers a path, a path to be followed, virtues to be practiced, to be actualized, and some state of compassion or love to guide people in their lives. Something like that. <coughs> So you've got to step back when you're looking at scriptures, but we also have to step aside. So if, you know, in our Jewish Christian world, if we step aside, it means you've got to kind of look and see what, uh, what the Hindus are saying and, and what the Buddhists are saying and what a whole bunch of other people are saying. Because that could be You could find another way to talk. You could find another way to think about it. Because they do raise similar issues. In fact, they're the same issues. Does it have any meaning? Is it a joke? Paul Menard, famous biologist, said that since we've understood the, uh, uh, the physiology of the brain, we can get rid of all that religion stuff, and life has no meaning. It's an accident. It just happened. You die. That's it. 
should. That's <laughs> pretty much what he said. You know, uh, and there are a lot of people who say things like that. Does it have any meaning? Why do we die? What happens? Christian arguments for the immortality of the soul are used by Buddhists to support reincarnation. You know, because they always argue that our spirit or our soul or whatever you call it, the Christians argue it's not intrinsically dependent upon this body. Buddhists use the same argument to say, okay, that's fine, it goes to another body. After a process, 49 days of wandering about and such. Uh, but it's still the same issue. What happens? Why? Why? Yeah. But they always raise similar issues and they always wind up with a path. Their doctrines are sometimes different, and their answers are often different, and their teachings are certainly different. They do not all teach the same thing. Buddhists have no God, because that category was not available. <coughs> the category of God was already filled from ancient India with all kinds of anthropomorphic gods, gods who were super beings. And when Buddhists looked at those, they said, that can't be what's really real. There are just too many of them. There's a whole pantheon of them. And you know, the Hindus would say, well, you know, you could take your, choose your God. You could have your chosen God, and that would be the ultimate. And that's still the same. There's one supreme deity. Or the Vedantas philosophers would say, really, there's only Brahma, which is the one true reality of all that is. And if you're enlightened, you realize that you're non-dual, that you're one with Brahma, which is all that there is anywhere. So that Hindu sages could go and meditate and become one with Brahma, or they might call it God. It doesn't matter as long as you realize that you're not separate, that there's no separateness between us and ultimate reality. So if you die, it doesn't matter because you're already one with reality. And they have ancient scriptures called the Upanishads that teach this, you know, where the master's instructing the student so that that student will realize that he or she is that Brahma, that there's simply an identity between all beings in the world. That's a different teaching, but still the path is meditation and prayer and once you're enlightened, it's teaching, compassion. Hmm. There's also a cultural thing that's happened since I was a young man, and since you were young, most of you. In 1950, our cultures were almost identical with our religions. You know, if you were American, you could be Protestant, Catholic, Jew. Will Herbert wrote a book by that name. And he was pretty much online, you know, except he forgot about black people, but that's another story. Uh, it was Protestant Catholic Jew substituted for being Irish, Italian, Polish for your ethnic identity. And you came out of it being identified as that, and they were the acceptable identities. If you said, I'm a Buddhist, it wasn't quite acceptable. That just meant you were weird. You were an outlier, or maybe Chinese. You know, but you certainly weren't a red-blooded American, because there was an identity in the 50s between our culture and our, our religions. You know. That's changed. That's not true of our children and grandchildren. I taught at Millbury for 19 years. Bill Baldwin is doing it now, and, and there were two people ahead of me. I taught some, how many? 2,000 students over that time. So all of those students have an idea about what Buddhism is and what Taoism is, and they have some idea about what Hinduism is. Uh, they have more options. They, have, they know that there are more answers than I knew in the 1950s when, or in the 60s. When I was 20 years old, I was born in 1940. When I was 20 years old, you know, I knew there were other religions, but they were mostly just like, you know, fields for evangelism. <laughs> we were going to go and instruct those people. We just didn't know what they were talking about. You know. 
but people don't do. And so I can't imagine, you know, it's been now 50 years that Middlebury College has been teaching other religions. They te we teach Islam there, we teach, Ju well, you know, besides Christian Judas stuff, we teach Islam, we teach Hinduism, we teach Buddhism, I don't know what else we teach there these days. But the same thing is happening at every liberal college, at every university in the country and in Europe, and in Canada. A little bit of Mexico, but they're just kind of getting started in South America. Uh, but they are getting started. So you're going to have a whole group of people who have many, many more options than we ever did as we grew up. And, and it makes people sometimes say it's all relative and none of it matters. No. And so you hear people talking about, I'm spiritual but not religious, which I think is absolute bullshit. <laughs> you know, it means I have some nice feelings every now and then. <laughs> no one goes into a Baskin and Robbins. Are there still Baskin and Robbins around? Mm -hmm. not, not, in not in Vermont. Not in Vermont. Because, but anyway, they used to be in Philadelphia. And they had 57 different flavors. But nobody went in and came out without an ice cream. <laughs> Nobody did that. Mm -hmm. Nobody said, there are too many things that I have to choose, so I'm not <laughs> going to choose any. You wanted an ice cream of some kind, but still there's a hesitancy here. And there are reasons for that, too. If you want to read them all, uh, uh, read uh, Charles Taylor's The Sector Age. He's got them all mapped out. Beautiful. Six, seven hundred pages. Beautiful. <laughs> There's also a short summary by a guy named A.K. A. K. Smith, how not to be secular, uh, because he's a theologian. But, that, but the whole book really just is describing what Taylor accomplished in the secular age. And it tells us how we got here, how we got here. And part of that problem is that we have to step aside. We have to step aside from our own religion to look at others to enrich them, but we also have to step aside and look at the world of science. Because a lot of what goes on is because of, due to, connected with science in some way. And I would maintain there's no conflict between any religion and science, but there's a lot of conflict between the opinion of scientists, the extra scientific opinions of scientists, and religion. So you get people like Manad, who I talked about before, and there are others who simply say it's an accident. This shouldn't have happened. It just happened that some genes got together and we're here. There's no meaning to anything. Or the famous uh, uh, Richard Dawkins, who can really write well. And gosh, he writes good books. He, he does. He, he, he is a, he's got a smooth pen. <clears throat> and he says, it's all our genes, there's nothing beyond that, and it's all survival value. And he presents it as if it were the agreed upon uh, science of the matter, and it certainly isn't. I mean, even other scientists who aren't theists don't agree with him at all. They say there's a much more complicated process involved. Stephen J. Gould also writes well. He's wrote a wonderful book called, uh -oh. Hmm? No. Science and religion, the two magistra. Uh, it's a book about science and religion, but I can't remember the name. It's a bestseller. It'll probably come up first on, uh, on Amazon. Uh, he's an agnostic, but he says, you know, he invented the word that there are handed down with genes things he called spandrels, which were uh, flourishes first on an arch, if you had a if you had a square arch, you would put a spandrel in to make it seem like it was curved, and the spandrel was that little triangle at the sides that had no functional purpose. But then later it did, because they found out that if you made that really solid enough, you could put more weight on top. Well, he says in biology there are spandrels. There are part of our genes that are, have no really function in adaptive, uh, making us more adaptive, more foot fit to live, but that eventually you get new characteristics out of them so that evolution is emerging. That it's not just the repeating of different 
of the same things, but there are emergent genera and emergent species. And that's an argument too. Some people say they don't emerge, they just happen. But uh, Gould didn't think that, nor did uh, Lavotin, who's another physicist. Is, he wrote a book together with, the, with Gould on this. <coughs> and he lives in Brattleboro, which I just found out. It's just an interesting aside, you know. But, you know, I think that you have to kind of argue with extra scientific opinion because you do have kind of a priesthood of scientists that can speak with more authority than anybody from a pulpit anywhere. Mainly because clergy have lost a lot of their cachet. You know, they, because oftentimes the people sitting in the pews just know twice as much as they do. It, it, just, it, it didn't used to be that way. They used to be trained to be way smarter when people didn't go to school. But they go to school now, so it's all changed. But you can't quite understand what scientists are doing, except you know it's really cool. <laughs> and they're talking about space and time. And they're talking about things that you don't understand, but you do believe. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I love to read books on science. And whenever they begin to talk mathematics, they lose me. But I believe what they say because they're trustworthy when they're doing science. They're not trustworthy when they're doing philosophy. And you can get them all over the field. And you, all kinds of scientists, even the greatest ones, can like dip into philosophy and pretend <coughs> that they're speaking still with the authority of science. So I think you've got to like dig in, you know, you have to step back from the text to look into its deep level, to look into its history, to look into how it's interpreted. And you've got to step aside, I think, to look at other religions to see where you might enrich your own. There are plenty of texts in the New Testament that speak of salvation as awakening and enlightenment, which is very Buddhist and very Hindu. There's a famous passage in Ephesians that says, sleeper, Awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will enlighten you. That, for Ephesians, is what salvation consists in. Awaken. Well, the Buddha could have said that. In fact, he probably did say that, except for the business about rising from the dead. But then you, you, know, you have to question, what does that mean? And most theologians will insist that it does not mean resuscitation. No one's saying Jesus was resuscitated. They're saying he rose. And, yeah. Yeah, and that people experienced him as alive. We're saying that. The text also says you have to pray to the Holy Spirit that the eyes of your hearts be enlightened. Are we that far off? I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, these are the three meditations that, you know, I kind of offer you today. And um, let's talk about them. That's really all I have to offer. And let's, uh, I don't know, let's argue about this stuff. Well, thank you, John. That was really great. Arguments, so mm -hmm. please, by all means, go ahead. Yeah. Do you have any comments about Stephen Hawking? Yeah, I think he was a brilliant scientist and a mistaken philosopher. And he's buried at Westminster Cathedral. <laughs> Did you read that? Yeah, he died recently. Yeah, he died recently, but he's buried there, I think, next to Charles Darwin. Oh. He's also buried there. And, you know, I think they bury any important Englishman in Westminster. I don't, I don't know which one. But he was a famous atheist whose arguments were usually the same arguments that Thomas Aquinas would have used, would have, did use, in fact, to prove that we didn't know what God was. Aquinas said we know that God is, but not what God is. No what at all. And he got that from Gregory of Nyssa, who said that anybody starts talking to you about what God is, you know immediately that person's a liar. Mm -hmm. So there's this whole tradition in Christian Jewish texts 
of silencing speech or apophasis, that you say things by denying them. And that goes back to Gregory and to some text in the New Testament. And it's always accompanied by saying things by putting them in words, which is cataphasis. Cataphasis means to speak, and kata means down. You're, you're speaking into the words. So every tradition has that. The Buddhists would say that all that we say about awakening, or about the Buddha path, or about the Buddha, is conventional, simply because it's dependent on language. And language forms our mind. It, it, it molds them so that it can ask and think within this horizon and not that horizon. Uh, and I kind of think that uh, Hawking didn't understand any of that because he was an atheist from the time he was a teenager. And so I think he rejected uh, the interventionist God who could somehow uh, break into the natural order of things and do a miracle or two because somehow he messed it up first. I don't know why he did it. Uh, most theologians today, though, would reject both a completely imminent God and a completely transcendent God. Many theologians would. And talk about panentheism, which means that God is present in everything. That's where you find it. You don't find the God who's up here, outside of the whole process, kind of looking down, figuring who's doing sex and who, you know, whatever. Whatever God would figure, it's just, he's just not there. So he was right about that. But he wasn't right, I think, to simply say there's no ultimate meaning to the things. So, you know, as a physicist, I respect him greatly. Although I bought a couple of his books and I couldn't understand them. <laughs> uh, I bought Brief History of Time, and it wasn't brief enough. <laughs> it was, or maybe it was too brief, I don't know. I, I didn't understand. But he kept trying to work out some formula to account for what caused the Big Bang. And I, I just didn't understand it. I don't know what he's talking about. You'd have to talk to a physicist. Do you think people are ready to question their own religion, their own dearly held religion? Sometimes. Yeah. Some are, some are not. Some, the more they're threatened, the more they cling to. Yeah. Yeah, the Buddhists think that clinging is one of, like, you know, the most common phenomenon. And so they don't want you to cling to viewpoints at all, even if they're Buddhist. So the main thinker of the Mahayana traditions that Bill and I are so engaged with is that you not cling to your own viewpoints, even if your viewpoints are the most liberal in the world or the most open-minded in the world. As long as you have a viewpoint, it's an obstacle. Because then you're you're letting the language screw up with your consciousness, screw up with your mind. Uh, and so they always talk about permeations of language, that language seeps into your mind from the beginning, from your two years old, and they start to tell you things, you start to learn words, you start to put things together, and you cling to what you've got, because in some ways it works very well. Common sense world, we function quite well in it, all of us. You know, if you don't function in it, then they begin to think there's something wrong with you. But when you get into worlds of deeper meaning, common sense no longer is relevant because you're not trying to explain things through common sense. You're trying, if you're a scientist, you're trying to explain correlations between things that have no relation to you at all. Or time and space, or, you know. So. John, yeah. uh, what might correspond in some way within a Christian tradition or practice to what you're just talking about in relation to Buddhism? That it's is interesting. I've stepped, I've stepped back now, you see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would think the whole tradition in the New Testament about agape, which is love 
disinterested. You get nothing out of it. You just love people because they are. You love dogs because they are, cats. You, you love the universe simply because it is. Uh, that is uh, uh, very close to my mind to compassion. That you're feeling compassion for those who suffer. You try and help them as best you can. Uh, and you empty your mind of anything that might get in the way. So the Buddhist always talk about emptiness, you know. But then so were the traditions I grew up with. So was Gregory of Nyssa talking about emptiness. Uh, so were most of the theologians I read. That you you don't have any concept equal to God, so get rid of all of them. Don't don't have anything left. Uh, but you know, in the, I grew up in Roman Catholic tradition, and in there, there was always a split between doing theology, which was like serious business, and spiritual spirituality, which was in a different category. And so most of that uh, mystical stuff was in spiritual theology, and they, they never really meshed. But they should, and they do. I mean, if you read the books of William Johnson, it was Jesuit in Tokyo <coughs> University. Uh, they mesh. They come together. There's a whole bunch of people who read like that. Uh, read Thich Nhat Hanh's book, Jesus and Buddha, his brothers. That was a good little book. You know. uh, or the Dalai Lama, who speaks only about these kinds of very basic things. He never gets into Buddhist theology or philosophy. When he came here, we tried to get him, and he just wouldn't. He wanted to speak about kindness and mercy and love. That's all he did. And so his books are good. You know. Yeah. Publicly chanted for some time, hmm? and publicly chanted. Did he chant for quite a while? Back way back here at uh, here in Millbury, when he was yeah. on the stage in the big yeah, okay. yeah. 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 yeah it's, it's a, he's a he's a cool guy. <laughs> yeah. Any last questions? All right, well, there are a few books of John's that he brought, if anyone would like to look, and we also have information. Um, if you want to sign up to get more information on First Wednesdays or leave feedback. Thank you again. It's wonderful.